Hello and welcome to the MJ Row Music Show. Are you a trip hop fan looking to find out the history of the genre? Or someone who doesn't even know what trip hop is and thinks that it's just what happens when a rapper falls down the stairs? Well, without further ado, let's dive right in. So, in the late 1980s in the city of Bristol, in the UK city of Bristol, a local sound system formed called the Wild Bunch, made up of local DJs, MCs, b-boys and visual artists who are all heavily influenced by a lot of the same factors, particularly the sound of hip-hop that was coming over from America to the UK at this point, the culturally diverse music that was around the city at this point, particularly being played at clubs like The Dugout, which played a whole variety of stuff going from dub, reggae and hip-hop right over to post-punk and rave and also the more arty side of the city, particularly coming from the art students at the local universities and all the local graffiti artists. And this sound system created their unique style of hip hop production. It was had a lot more of a bass heavy drum beat and was more slowed down and laid back. You had quite a psychedelic mixing pop feel with the sheer amount of genres that all brought together, elements of hip hop, soul, dub, reggae. You also element I don't know what that one was, but also elements of post-punk capturing the sort of gothic, atmospheric, wibbly gloominess of acts like The Cure and Susie and the Banshees, yet also the urban bleak quirkiness of acts like The Specials. So, in 1989, this sound system suddenly burst through to worldwide acclaim after producing the album Sweet Like Sushi by Nena Cherry, but unfortunately shortly after this they all broke up. But all but a few, a few of them all came back together and formed the first major trip hop group, Massive Attack. And in 1991, they released their magnum opus with the track Unfinished Sympathy. It was it, it sort of entered the charts because it matched the soul, very much matched a lot of the soul scene that was popular in the UK at the time, from acts like Soul to Soul and Seal. You had more of a bleak more of a gritty urban bleakness that a lot of those artists didn't have. And from this point on, the genre was set. The, this was furthered in the, in the debut album that accompanied Unfinished Sympathy, Blue Lines, which is a milestone for UK hip-hop, deliver it in a way that was very different from the court, from the usual, yeah, party hard sort of hip-hop that was popular in the 80s, and delivering more the bleak urban realism that sort of encompasses UK hip-hop now. And so from this point, the genre was set, and it was just an up and up from there. In 1992, you got the first major trip hop label called No Wax. And then in around, around this sort of point, you decided to get trip hop's fusion or at least association with the UK rave and dance scene of the time, which seems a bit unusual since trip hop didn't really seem to have or seem to lean towards a specific genre. It was a whole combo of R&B, hip hop and electronica. But I think the reason that the rave scene took it on is that it sort of was sort of reminiscent of the laid back nature of ambient house artists like the Orb and Aphex Twin. And so as a result, tons of the major rave and dance acts of the time, particularly, particularly Bjork, Leftfield and Faithless all took up the trip hop sound and gradually became more and more trip hop based of each passing album. And in fact, in 1994, the term itself was set by the magazine Mix Mag in relation to an interview of a track by DJ Shadow. And then suddenly we started getting major release after major release. And probably the biggest of these was the album Dummy by Portishead. And this was the first album that you could probably say was trip hop through and through. Like with the mass early Massive Attack albums, you could still say all oh, they were soul albums or all oh, they were hip hop albums. But this was an album that was totally unique. It had some of the sampling of hip hop. It had some of the laid back nature of electronica, but it definitely didn't belong to any of them. It was a whole fusion of things that created its own unique gothic atmosphere. And a lot of this same sort of production style spread onto the, and the other major release of around this middle period, Max Inque by Tricky, which had perf all the perfect appeal for the alternative indie scene of the mid 90s, particularly in how it not only had trip hop elements, but also elements of other styles of the time that were majorly popular, particularly alternative rock, which took place on tracks like Black Steel and Brand New Euretro. And we also got another major new development in trip hop at this point, where Mo Wax started re releasing tons of major releases, particularly from Rob Dugan, DJ Crush, who was a Japanese trip hop musician, 
but also in how trip hop, in elements of trip hop style, Grass started to make their way into hip hop, particularly in the late night atmospherics and plunder phonics of DJ Shadows introducing, and in the more quirky, bleak, dark bizarreness of Dr. Octagon. Then you get to around 1996, 1997, and trip hop is definitely becoming a lot sleeker in production style, and more so brushing away the crackle of the sampling, and producing something that's more akin to IDM in its stylization, and particularly came from releases like Massive Attack's Mezzanine, the, probably their most commercially successful album, and by Homogenic by Bjork. And funnily enough, once we got this more IDM-based sleekness, Trip hop became a, elements of trip hop style became a lot more prevalent in IDM albums, most notably in the bass heavy beats of the Boards of Canada, and just in some of the shit and just some of the way the production came across on albums like Kid A by Radiohead. But the true major big development around this late 90s point was the arisal of down tempo, taking more taking fully on the laid back nature of trip hop. But instead of doing it in like a bleak, bizarre way, doing it in a more summery, feel-good, euphoric way. This hit the scene in 1998 with the album Moon Safari by Air, another album which had major appeal and global success towards the more alternative indie music fans of the time. And this continued in 1999 with another major release, Play by Moby, which trip-hop artists had been big before. Massive Attack and Bjork had good, big, huge followings, but this but play was the first time an artist of this sort of style became a global pop megastar, pretty much an A-list celebrity on the Hollywood part on the, all the Hollywood parties and all that, selling 10 million copies worldwide and pretty much being featured in every album in existence around this turn of the millennium period. And alas, here we are, the turn of the millennium. And at this point, trip hop had become such a major part of alternative music at this point, they then became a major part of pop music as well. You could see its influence in releases by the likes of Everything But The Girl and Dido, but most prominently in the, in the pop tracks and albums that were produced by William Orbit, such as those by Beth Orton, All Saints, and most notably in the massive global success that was Madonna's Ray of Light. And at this point in the early 2000s, the genre was still continuing really strong. You had tons of con a continued slew of major releases coming out, particularly from The Gorillas, Goldfrap, and Down Tempo continued to have majorly successful releases from Roixoc, Zero Seven, Morchiba, Lemon Jelly. While whilst all the established trip hop artists continue to have major success, Massive Attack was still being successful, Moby still successful, Air still successful. But then, once you get to the midpoint in the 2000s, the success started to filter out. Some of them, like Massive Attack and Air, started making more anti-commercial albums that meant they sort of slipped out of the charts and public appeal. Whereas a lot of down-tempo artists were sometimes lost on the people who preferred the more dark and bleak side of trip-hop, believing the artists had sold out for this more holiday villa-friendly sound. And so little by little, the genre sort of faded away from the popular mainstream. But its influence was still pretty pre prevalent in the late 2000s, particularly amongst alternative acts like TV on the Radio, Niles Barkley, Goche, and some more of the later releases by Radiohead. The interesting thing with trip hop is it's one of those genres where even if there's not a scene, a like a trip hop scene going on now, it's still definitely, you still can't say it's died out because what's happened is the reason there isn't a scene anymore is become, it's become such an integral part of alternative music that its influence is everywhere already. You know, there's no scene of it because it's just everywhere. It's just ingrained in the DNA of alternative music now and it's left a absolutely huge legacy. As mentioned earlier, the fact that we have a UK hip hop scene with grime like we do now can be traced back to Massive Attack's first album, Blue Lines. The fact that we got a variety of, of urban-based UK electronic scenes in the late 90s with drum and bass from Goldie and Roni Size to UK Garage from MJ Cole and Craig David, that can be linked to Massive Attack setting the tempo for this sort of scene arising. 
You'll see it's influenced heavily on hip-hop music. Dr. DJ Shadow and Dr. Octagon, Octagon <laughs> introduced a more quirky, plunderphonics-based style of hip-hop, which soon became quite popular in the early 2000s, particularly on the Stones Throw record, where we've major releases from Mad Lib and MF Doom. We can then see this influence spreading to the likes of Flying Lotus today. And just basically any scene that has urban, sort of late night urban gritty bleakness, but somehow still quite laid back and soulful, yet at the same time quite has quite a bizarre melting pot appeal. That's pretty much got a trip hop basis or a trip hop link. You can see this in the dubstep of the late 2000s from Burial and Scream, particularly in how that genre was extremely reggae based in the same way trip hop was in its production. See this in the it's in the whole late night vibe of UK bass artists like Bonobo, James Blake, Sampha and Subtract. You can see it in the more electronically based hip hop artists, UK hip hop artists of the moment, like the Young Fathers and Ghost Poet. You can see it in the bizarre R&B of FKA Twigs, which is, captures a sort of stylistic darkness that Massive Attack had. You, like King, King Krull's album, The Use, pretty much sounds exactly like a 90s trip-hop album, and I can even just see it popping up in some of my favourite albums from last year, particularly in the release by These New Puritans, which captured a Lynchian post-punk revivalism, which reminded me where it's late night atmospherics just seemed very reminiscent of trip hop to me. So, in the best I can do with all my ramblings and my initial head knowledge, that is the history of trip hop. Comment below with what other genres, histories you'd like me to go through. I'm planning on doing one in shoegaze, on shoegaze in future. And thank you for listening. Goodbye.